So today we start a series that I've been wanting to do for some time. Uh, I wanted to do just a, a set of teaching on the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and what is this idea and what are these understandings and how do we apply those and what difference does it make and it's just such a dominant theme in the teaching of Jesus and so today I want to probably maybe set up some of that. I, basically what, I, what I've done is I've just, I've looked for the word kingdom all throughout the Gospels and maybe we'll even go beyond that. I don't, even know, I don't know how long this series is going to go. I don't know what it's going to look like. We shall see. Um, but I want to look at some of the parables. Some of my favorite parts of Jesus' teaching are the parables where, uh, and one of the themes that he has in those parables is the kingdom of God is like. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like. And so I want to take a look at those teachings, but I, I thought, well, I don't want to just, I don't want to just do the parables. I just, so I just did a, a word search for kingdom and where it shows up in the gospels. Maybe we'll even look throughout other places of the new Testament. We'll see when we get there. Um, but I, I, that's, that's kind of where we're, and I'm just going to kind of look at chunks of scripture and references that we can look at and just kind of have this ongoing conversation about um, the kingdom and, and what it is and, and what it looks like. So the, you know, I said just a moment ago, it's such a dominant piece of Jesus's teaching and it's very dominant and actually has been such a dominant part of his teaching that there are scholars out there that I've read that suggest or believe or push the idea that really Jesus is the one that he's the first one to really talk about the kingdom of God like this. And maybe there's even some truth to that statement. Like, maybe Jesus is the first person to have this kind of an emphasis on the kingdom of God. Maybe Jesus is the first person to have, you know, this, this kind of understanding of the kingdom of God and, and, and a theology of the kingdom of God. Maybe there's some truth to that. I tend to disagree. Like, this is not a, um, this is, this is not a unique idea. And, and we'd have to remember that, um, that Jesus isn't even the first person to come preaching that. Like John, John the Baptist is the first person, obviously at the very least a cousin and contemporary and colleague of Jesus. Um, if you're familiar with the podcast, we spend a lot of time on session three and I share one of the suggestions of my teachers, which was that John the Baptist actually functioned as an informal rabbi to Jesus. Jesus who probably wouldn't have been accepted amongst other typical, more traditional um, schooling systems or rabbinical opportunities. And so John, this contemporary cousin of his, kind of takes him under his wing and, and helps get him ready for ministry. Um, you can think that's a crazy idea and that's totally okay. Um, and you can listen to the podcast if you want more explanation of that. I'll try to link the podcast in the notes below. Um, but I really don't want to pull that apart in the comments section. So uh, just an idea. But at the very least, John serves as a contemporary, uh, a colleague of Jesus. And Matthew chapter 3, one of the first references to kingdom that we see is John the Baptist going out telling everybody to repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. Um, and then in the very next chapter, we're told that Jesus picks up this same message and this same mantle saying the exact same thing. Jesus goes throughout the countryside preaching this message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is the dominant, this is the theme, this is the, I don't want to call it a campaign slogan, but this is the dominant idea that seems to serve as a foundation for Jesus' teaching. So it, it is very, it is a very dominant idea. And I would agree that we don't necessarily see this throughout Judaism, but nor do I think this is the first time that we're seeing it or that Jesus' teaching somehow appears in a vacuum. I don't even think it's like that necessarily that unique. I think Jesus is entering into a conversation that the world of his day is having and he puts his own spin on it and he definitely is going to do stuff with his teaching that we've never seen before. But I think Jesus is wading into a conversation that everybody is having, thinking about, wrestling with, and he's saying, I have something to say about that. And so, I mean, this idea of kingdom of God goes way, way back. Uh, Jewish thought roots it even in the Exodus. And, and I don't think you have to go after Jesus to find Jewish thought doing that. We're told in Exodus 14, 
uh, Israel crosses the Red Sea. They get to the other side of the Red Sea and they start uh, celebrating and singing their praises. And we're told that one of the things that they talk about is this phrase, Adonai imloch ha'olam va'ed. Adonai imloch ha'olam va'ed. The Lord is reigning forever and ever. The Lord is reigning forever and ever. And you have this idea in Exodus about the reign of God. And this stands obviously in juxtaposition with the reign of Pharaoh, the reign of Egypt, the reign of empire that they've just come out of, they've just exited out of, crossed the Red Sea, been delivered from, but now there's a new reign and it is the reign of God. And it's not but a few chapters later in Exodus 19 when they finally get to Sinai 40 days later and God comes to them and he says, um, uh, the, he comes to them and, and he says, if you'll enter into this covenant, you will be for me, uh, my, my most treasured possession, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so here early in the story, in the book of Exodus, we have this idea of God's kingdom and this kingdom being directly connected to his people. Like God says, I've rescued you from Egypt. I've brought you to Mount Sinai. I have this covenant that I want to give you, a covenant I want to be in with you. And if you will be in this covenant with me, then you will be for me a kingdom of priests, which is an interesting expression nonetheless. And I'm not going to focus on that here today, but it's this idea of kingdom. Kingdom is not an unusual word in the Hebrew scriptures at all. And it goes all the way back to the Exodus, this reign of God. Adonai imloch alam ba'ed, the Lord is reigning forever and ever. The kingdom of priests. Now then, all throughout your Old Testament, especially in the prophets, you're going to have all kinds of references to kingdom, God's kingdom, the kingdom that will, and, and at one period in your Hebrew scriptures, it's definitely connected to the idea of David, Saul, Solomon, a kingdom, God's kingdom, like there's a literal monarchy and, and a king on a throne, like there's a kingdom and then that empire, God's kingdom, God's, the, the empire of, of Israel falls apart, splits into a divided kingdom, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. And again, kingdom language is not a new idea. It's not something that shows up in your gospels. It's something that is a very physical, more literal kingdom. And then as the story continues to progress, and even as God's people get taken off into exile, the prophets continue to speak of God's kingdom. Now, in my mind, there's no doubt that this kingdom that the prophets reference still has very heavy political overtones for them. It's rooted in a past experience of a very literal kingdom. It, uh, it, it's kind of hinting at and putting its hope in a restored kingdom, and I think they think about that, at least in some part, in a very literal sense, a restored kingdom at that point in history. But the prophetic use of God's kingdom, like there's this kingdom that's going to reign, it will stretch from sea to sea. It will be an everlasting kingdom, and his reign will never end, the prophets talk about. And so that idea is also a little bit bigger. It's a little bit more transcendent. It's a little bit it's more than just a political reality of, you know, the, the, the kingdom under David, the Davidic kingdom, or a restored kingdom after Babylon, or like there's a political reality to it, and there's, without any doubt, political overtones and undertones to the prophets using this idea of king. But kingdom, the idea of kingdom is growing and developing and evolving within the Jewish consciousness. And I would say, in some sense, it's taking the idea that God introduced to them in Exodus and the experience they've had in a very literal kingdom in the middle of their story, and it's kind of marrying these two into a little bit bigger of an idea. And it's into this world that Second Temple Judaism is trying to wrestle and grapple with their own experience in the middle of Rome. So they hear these prophetic voices that were written, most of them, many of them, during the days of Babylon and another kingdom, another oppressor, another group of people, another point in history. And yet 
it, those two experiences marry each other so easily. Their, their current experience as they sit under Roman oppression. And so you hear the words of the prophets talking about kingdom. Then the Jewish conversation, I don't think Jesus is bringing up something new. I think Jesus is speaking into the current consciousness of Jewish thought, and he's talking about kingdom. And in his day, this conversation about kingdom, unsurprisingly, it should not come as a shock to us that even then in his day, this conversation still has very political overtones and undertones. I think many times we've made too much of that. I think we talk about, well, the Jews just wanted a political messiah and a military ruler. And yeah, I mean, there, there was certainly those, those elements of the conversation. The conversation was also much bigger and much wider than that as well. They understood God's kingdom to be more than just political rescue. But we shouldn't think for a moment that they didn't yearn for a political reality, a rescue from Roman oppressors. Like, of course, that was a part of the conversation. And we should relate to this very well, by the way. <laughs> it, it probably should not shock us that we should relate to this. In, in 21st century America, where we have married our faith expressions to our political ideologies, and it's become very, very difficult to pull those two things apart. And quite frankly, it's been unbelievably destructive um, and probably idolatrous to, uh, to some extent, the way that we have married these realities together. So we, we understand what it means to take a, a, a spiritual conversation, something rooted in an idea that's more grounded and more transcendent and, and has more substance to it than just my immediate political circumstances. And, and, we, and we should know what it's like to kind of con consistently and constantly get distracted by this other conversation that seems to miss the point of what God's really, truly inviting us into. So that, that's your setting. That's your setup when, when, when we show up. And, and just to kind of further back up this idea that this isn't a new idea um, with Jesus, that Jesus starts. Judaism had a teaching about the threefold nature of the kingdom of God. And you can debate about exactly when this teaching started, but I think we're going to see evidence today that this predates Jesus. Unless Jesus is the originator of this idea, and he might be, I tend to think that that's not what Jesus typically likes to do. I think Jesus usually likes to enter into a conversation that's already taking place so that he can speak our language. But maybe he, maybe he's the originator of this idea. But there was uh, the, the idea that the kingdom of God comes. The kingdom of God shows up when three things happen. First, the finger of God moves. The finger of God, and they'll often talk about the little, the little finger of God, the pinky. It just takes the pinky finger of God. The finger of God has to move. And again, where is that language rooted? In the Exodus. It's the magicians in the Exodus that tell Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And I've been told that the Hebrew there kind of hints at, this is, this is the pinky of God. Can you imagine what the hand of God, can you imagine what the arm of God could do? This is just the finger of God, Pharaoh. That's what his own magicians tell him. And, and, so, and so the finger of God rooted in, in Exodus. And, and step number two that the Jews... So the first one is the finger of God. The second one is that the people have to call him Lord. And that phrase, again, going back to the Exodus, that phrase, Adonai imlo ha'olam va'ed, one of the first places where the Israelites in the story call upon God as their God. They call upon the name of God. One of the first, not that, I don't believe it's the first time. It is one of the first times that the corporate people of God call upon the name of Adonai, their God. They call him Lord. So the finger of God moves. God rescues them from Egypt, the, the plagues, the exodus. People call him Lord at, uh, on the other side of the Red Sea on their way to Sinai. When they arrive at Sinai, people call him Lord. And then after Sinai, God gives them the law. And the third step of kingdom is they respond in obedience. So step number one, people, uh, the finger of God moves. Step number two, people call him Lord. Step number three, people respond in obedience to what he wants to be true in his kingdom. And that's when kingdom shows up. And only when all three things happen does kingdom show up 
or so the Jewish teaching goes. Uh, the one thing that we can't control is the finger of God. Beautifully, graciously, the finger of God is always at work. God is always moving and God has moved. So really the conversation is about the last two. And, 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 and what, we, what we in the Christian world often experience is people that want to recognize that the finger of God moved and called him Lord, and they just don't really care about responding in obedience. And the Jews would say, that's fine. In the Christian conversation, maybe we're even saved, but kingdom doesn't show up if you don't respond in obedience. It's not, I don't know if that means you're, you're going to heaven or that's not, that's not my point. It just means that kingdom doesn't show up if you don't respond in obedience. On the flip side, sometimes we um, find ourselves outside the world of the, the Christian paradigm and you find that the finger of God is moving and people respond in obedience, number one and number three, but there's no recognition of who the king is. Nobody calls him Lord. And the Jewish thought would be, well, kingdom still doesn't show up. It, if nobody recognizes the kingship of the king, then kingdom doesn't come. So kingdom only shows up when we do all three things, when the finger of God moves, when we call him Lord, and when we respond in obedience. I think you're going to see that come up in Jesus's teaching, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you decide. And so again, this is the, and, and again, you're, when we talk about this, when we talk about the Jewish understanding of the threefold kingdom, what you're noticing is that the kingdom is this it's not just a physical, political reality. The conversation is talking about something bigger, something wider, something more substantial. The kingdom of God is talking about something present. It's not something that happens after we die. It's something that happens right here in this world. I think we'll see this again with Jesus' teaching. It is the kingdom of God is a present reality that it's bigness. That's the kingdom of God. Now, we're I'm going to start the conversations that we have here in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven. And a lot of people are like, well, what's the, is that the same thing, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God? The answer is yes. It, it becomes clear when you look at the synoptics, when you look at the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, even when you look at John, it becomes clear that they use the term kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven synonymously. And the reason that Matthew, this kingdom of heaven expression, is predominantly just a, a Matthew, um, a, a, a trait of his. It's a, it's, a, it's a characteristic that is unique to Matthew's gospel. And it makes sense because of who Matthew's audience is. Matthew's audience is a Jewish audience. And in the Jewish world of the first century, you did not say the name of God. You didn't say, you didn't put God on your lips because you were trying to perfect, you were trying to protect the holy name of God. And so you had all these other synonyms. You had, you might have Adonai or you might, they didn't use this, I don't believe, as in the ancient world, but Hashem is an expression that you might find today. Um, some of the other things that they might say is heaven. Heaven became a synonym that you could use for God. You might remember in the prodigal son story, the prodigal son comes back to the father and he says, I have sinned against heaven and against you. What does he mean? Does he mean he sinned against heaven? Well, what he's saying is I've sinned against God, but he won't put God, the name of God or the expression of God on his lips. That's too holy. So he uses a different expression rather than God. I've sinned against not, he could have said, I sinned against God and against you, but instead in a Jewish world, in a Jewish context, he says, I've sinned against heaven and against you. So, so that's why when you're reading in Matthew, we're going to use kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God synonymously. I don't think there's really much debate about whether or not that's um, the right move to make those expressions, those parallel stories that are harmonized in the other gospels. They're going to use those words interchangeably. So kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, whatever comes out of my mouth, we're talking about the same thing, okay? So really, um, like we said, in the gospel of Matthew, you have John the Baptist in Matthew 3 starting the conversation about, uh, about the kingdom of God. Repent for the kingdom of God is near at hand. Then in Matthew 4, Jesus picks up the same message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then... Uh, and then we get to the Sermon on the Mount. So what I wanted to do in today's video is just kind of do a cursory examination of how Jesus is talking about the kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount. It's going to be one of the places where Jesus kind of starts talking about the kingdom, 
in the most expansive way. And so let's take a look at what we find here. Let me make sure we're doing okay on time. We're doing okay for just a little bit. Let's see if we can get this done. Um, Jesus starts mentioning the kingdom of heaven right in the beginning, right with the Beatitudes. Uh, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's how he starts the Beatitudes. He also ends the Beatitudes with the same expression. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus takes the Beatitudes and on the front and the back end of this list of Beatitudes, he says, this is a group of blessed ones. These are the ones that God pronounces blessing on. This is the favored group because, and, and theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we talk about that in the podcast as far as the content. But notice the expression of the kingdom. This group of people, they know what the kingdom of heaven is like. This group, the, one, the ones who are poor in spirit, the ones who mourn, the ones who hunger and thirst in righteousness, the ones who are pure in heart, these are groups of people who understand. They can, they see I think at the very end of our series, when we get to the Gospel of John, I think this idea will come back. This is a group of people that understands and sees the kingdom of heaven for what it is. Let's see, what are the the next uh, few references we have here? How about verse 19 and 20? Um, Let's see, 19 and 20. Therefore, anyone who who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So again, you have the kingdom of heaven as a present reality. There's this present reality, and there are people who decide to do things the way that God invited them to do. Again, number three, respond in obedience. There are people responding in obedience, and they're a part of the kingdom of heaven. That In the kingdom economy, everything is different. In the world's economy, there are certain metrics, there are certain measurements, there are certain things that we find of value. In the world's economy, it's like this, but the kingdom of heaven has a different economy. The world's economy is like this, the kingdom of heaven's economy is backwards. And in the kingdom of heaven's economy, those who walk in obedience are greatest, and those who don't are least in the kingdom economy. Verse 20, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter that. So how do you get into this world? We live in this world. We live in the world's economy. We live in this worldly reality. How in the world do you you step into and find yourself in the kingdom economy living in a totally different paradigm? Well, Jesus says your righteousness, and and there he's not talking about, um, he's not talking about following the rules, because the Pharisees are the best at that. He's not talking about right living, necessarily, because the Pharisees are unbelievably, that's what the Pharisees do. How in the world could we be better than the Pharisees? Jesus' reference there is to Zedekah, righteousness, Zedekah, and Zedekah refers to right relationships, everything being in its appropriate place. And Jesus says the Pharisees are great at following the rules. The Pharisees are unbelievably devoted to their practice and their faith expression and their religious devotion. They're unbelievably devoted. But but what gets thrown off is right relationships. And your right relationships with other people, relationships with God, relationships with creation, your relationships need to be shalom. That's how you enter the kingdom of God. By, having, by putting the world back together and having right relationships, not just following. Obedience doesn't look like just following the rules. Obedience, in Jesus' mind, obedience looks like living in harmony with God's intentions. That's the kingdom of heaven. What do we have in chapter 6? Let's see, we'll go to chapter 6, verse 10. Sermon on the Mount still. Jesus is still preaching his sermon. He says, oh yes, How about uh, the Lord's Prayer, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, your kingdom, this kingdom of heaven, your kingdom, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. So God, we want your reign. We want your intention. 
We want your reality to be more true here on earth. We want things on earth to be more aligned with what you intend them to be. Your intention as you reign in heaven, we want that heavenly reality to be more present right now in this present world. All right, how about uh, chapter 6, verse 33? All these verses we know so well, but these are the verses of kingdom. And I think we always just hear kingdom and we, uh, we just kind of read over it. Let's see here, uh, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Notice how much Jesus is talking about kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount. All throughout the discussion, he keeps sprinkling in, we're praying for his kingdom. Blessed are this group of people because they know what kingdom tastes like. Pray that God's kingdom would come. Seek first his kingdom. There is a reality. There is a reign of God. There is an, an intention that God has for this world. Seek that. Live in harmony with that. Pursue that. And notice, notice again the word righteousness, Zedekah showing up, right? Your Zedekah has to surpass. Seek first his kingdom and his Zedekah. Seek God's economy, God's reality, God's intention, God's wholeness in relationships, God's shalom. Seek that. And then finally, chapter 7. There's one, there's one reference in chapter 7. I'm looking at my notes here. What do we got? Uh, 721, is that what my notes say? My eyes are so bad, everybody. Um, not everyone, listen to this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. In another part of the gospel, Jesus says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then you know that the kingdom of God has come among you. If I cast out faith, notice how Jesus, he, he's either the originator of the threefold teaching of the kingdom, or Jesus is aware of the threefold teaching of the kingdom and is speaking into that. And he's saying, well, you guys believe that kingdom only comes when three things happen. And I'm telling you that the finger of God is moving right here in your midst. If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then you know that the kingdom of God has come among you. And then here in this, in this verse, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. It's one thing to see the finger of God move and to call Jesus Lord, to call God Lord. It's one thing to call him Lord. It's another thing to respond in obedience. That's where kingdom comes. You can't enter the kingdom with only the first two. You can't enter the kingdom with just one and three. You have to have one, two, and three. All three parts to enter the kingdom of God. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So I want to spend time in this first lesson today simply talking about what the idea of kingdom is, where it comes from, to see that this was a prominent part. It was the foundation for Jesus' message and to show how, how, it, how, how dominantly it shows up in the, even just the Sermon on the Mount and to kind of get a sense, to see... What is Jesus's understanding of what the kingdom is? How does it work in his theology? There is this realm. There is this place where God is reigning. The reign of God, where things are as God intends it to be. That is the kingdom of God. We're invited to live in harmony with it. We're, in, we're invited to seek it and pursue it. We're invited to be a part of it. We're invited to partner with it. There is a reality and it's different. And we'll keep seeing this. We're going to see this throughout this whole series. Everything about the world's economy, God's economy, it's all different. It's functioning on different rules. And this is what Jesus is going to try to teach us all throughout his ministry and then the apostles after him. The kingdom of God is backwards. The kingdom of God is upside down. The kingdom of God, but it is a place where God's intention reigns. That just gets us started. We got so much more to talk about. I look forward to the next video. Talk to you then.